Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and welcome to another episode of Measuring Things Only I Care About. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the core voltage regulation of the best GTX 1080 PCB. And that PCB is, of course, the Galax GTX 1080 Hall of Fame. Now, I got this card on eBay, so a big thank you to the channel supporters for funding purchases like this one. Um, and before we get into this, also a big thank you to Elmore from Elmore Labs for updating the uh, EVC2 software uh, to like support more load line settings for this card, because uh, it turns out that this GTX 1080 has VDROOP out of the box, which uh, I really wasn't expecting. As far as I know, 10 series cards shouldn't have VDROOP. Um, but yeah, this thing has 0.3 milliohms of load line slope. Um, and that made, like, comparing it against the GTX 1080 Classified just completely unfair. Because if you, like, the voltage reg... Like, vo the especially if you're just looking at peak to peak. Um, like, the... But, uh, like, we'll get into it. But especially if you're looking at peak to peak, like, any amount of e-droop is going to drastically reduce peak to peak uh, results. Um... And yeah, so uh, it, it really doesn't make for a very fair comparison. But luckily with the EVC2, I can just turn the VDROOP off. Technically, the other option would have been to use the USB 005, uh, which is like an Infineon VRM dongle, but that only works with Infineon and international rectifier controllers, uh, whereas the EVC2 supports basically whatever Elmore implements. Um, so even like non-Infineon controllers. Um, so, though usually that would be, like, monolithic power systems controllers on uh, newer NVIDIA GPUs. But, anyway, um, yeah, uh, so big thank you to Elmore for sort of, you know, uh, making it easy to remove the V-droop on this card. And, uh, we're not really going to look at the PCB because I do plan to do a full PCB breakdown of this, but here is how the probing is hooked up, and I did take the photo with the card in the system, which is why the angle is all awkward. Um, but yeah, so I have coax soldered across, uh, one of the SP caps behind the GPU core. Uh, it's the cap furthest away from the V-Core VRM, because that should give us our worst measurements. And I do have a 50 ohm termination at the oscilloscope because with the fast transients that we're measuring here, not having a terminate like a 50 ohm termination at the scope uh, would lead to some excessive, like would lead to ringing in the coax and that would just ruin the measurements. So with that out of the way, uh, let's uh, take a look at the core voltage regulation. Um, and we are just gonna be running, like for this card, we are just gonna be running 3D Mark Firestrike. Um, but we're going to do something a bit different. So we're bo both going to like take a look at the like peak to peak. So we're just going to run GT1 alone. But we're also going to take a look at the performance. Because this is sort of the... like th This is the funny thing with like VDROOP and actually just voltages on modern-ish. and like Yeah, modern-ish because 900 series also does this. Um, but yeah, on modern-ish NVIDIA cards, um, like the performance of the GPU is, like, kind of directly tied to the core voltage, um, even though it doesn't reflect, like, the fi the actual, like, real-world operating voltage of the chip, like, drastically affect, well, it's not drastic, but it does affect the performance that you get. Um, so that leads to some, like, funny issues, like, um, like, if you have V-droop, the voltage regulation is better, right? Like, you have less peak-to-peak, -peak, you might have less undershoot relative to your under, uh, average voltage. But at the same time, because you have V-droop and the voltage on average is actually somewhat lower, uh, you end up with worse performance, uh, which, we'll, we, which we will be taking a look at today. Though, uh, I also just took a bunch of measurements uh, ahead of time, so depending on... Uh, things, we might just go with those, because, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, like, it, in my pre-testing, it was quite consistent, but I'm, I'm not sure if it's, like, 100% guaranteed to happen, so we are just going to be running Firestrike, because that's my preferred, uh, test for this, um, and actually, I guess we can look at the peak-to-peak -peak at the same time, because we can just do, like, a single run of Firestrike, um, I am also going to max out the power limit, just to make sure that we don't have, like, power throttling uh, affecting the operating voltage. Um, 
and uh yeah i am i forgetting anything for in terms of setup i don't think so so i guess we'll just run it i'm just gonna have to clear the statistics on the scope and i'm also gonna move this out of the way So, uh, for comparison, the GTX 1080 Classified, which I measured in the previous video, that was getting average peak-to-peak -peak of, like, 240 millivolts at the same 5 milliseconds per division time scale. So, you know, if it weren't for, like, this is, uh, like, so this looks like it's absolutely blowing the, the Classified PCB out of the water. But that's because there's a ton of e-droop um, relative to the Classified PCB. So th this doesn't actually really count. Um, so, yeah, wait, did I turn off? I mean, I guess I can just exit out of physics if physics th comes up. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is what the, the Hall of Fame's, uh, voltage regulation looks at like at, uh, stock settings. Um, and, uh, it looks really good, but you can also, like... Kind of, well, what makes it really noticeable that this has, like, a lot of e-droop is that the waveform isn't symmetrical. Because if you don't have e-droop, you will have basically overshoot and undershoot that are the same in both directions. Um, like, not exactly the same. Like, generally, you'll see more overshoot than under... Well, it depends on the voltage regulator, but usually you will see more overshoot than undershoot. But it'll be vaguely symmetrical because of how the voltage regulator behaves. Um... Anyway, so... Oh, that's a really bad score. That's really, really bad. Why is it so bad? Oh, it's because I'm running it into the capture card, isn't it? Yeah, it's gotta be. It's gotta be because I'm running it into the capture card. Oh, that is so annoying. Yeah, because in pre-testing, this card on stock settings was getting 23,500 points. And the reason... Actually, you can see. You can kind of see. I'm going to try catch it. Um, there we go. So, the capture card causes these, like, gaps in the render workload. I don't know why. Um, these also show up with e-cores. Like, if you have e-cores turned on, this also tends to happen more often. Uh, like, so, yeah, like, Firestrike is just weird. It gets, like, upset about things, but the capture card does this. Uh, Ryzen CPUs do this. Um, e-cores do this. <laughs> it's kind of a, kind of a shame, because it's, like, this is my favorite 3D benchmark. Um... Because it's relatively short, it has like a good variety of tests, like like you have the two GPU tests, and the two GPU tests are like very different. It isn't like TimeSpy where GT1, like I don't get what GT1 in TimeSpy is supposed to achieve. It like, it, it like it just GT2 is just longer and heavier and just like a better test in my opinion. So I don't know why GT1 exists in TimeSpy, whereas in Firestrike, GT1 and GT2... Like, GT1 really stresses the core. GT2 really stresses the memory. And that's, like, a very clear divide between the two of them. Um, so that's one of the reasons I like Firestrike. Also, the fact that you have, like, a CPU test, and then you finally have the combined test, whereas Time Spy doesn't have a combined test, right? Where the, the combined test, in my opinion, is uh, just kind of interesting in terms of... Um, in terms of that, it, like, usually cares a lot about GPU memory performance, like, even more so than GT2 does. Um, so that makes that test kind of fun if you're tuning, like, memory timings on AMD GPUs or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, also Firestrike just hates E-Cores, hates Ryzen CPUs, hates X290. Like, it's a very picky benchmark if you're, like, if your only priority is getting the highest possible GPU score, Firestrike hates everything, basically. <laughs> hates capture cards, hate like, yeah, so that's, it's really frustrating. So that's a really low score. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's consistent. So, I guess maybe, like, I don't think my memory settings got reset. And that those shouldn't affect it. No, they didn't. So, yeah. So, that's just Firestrike being Firestrike. Um, 
Anyway, so now let's turn off the V-Droop. So here's the EVC2 software. Um, and this down here is the like extra functionality. Um, and so we're just gonna enable load line override. Um, and actually I'm gonna do it for both loops even though it shouldn't be necessary. Um, and also here you can see how I know that this is 0 0.3 milliohms of load line slope. Also, yeah, the labeling doesn't seem to be correct because loop one actually like removes the, the V-droop even though that's supposedly on loop two. So I don't know, it might just be some weirdness with the controller. Um, as in the, the VRM controller on the card. But anyway, so yeah, now we're going to remove the V-droop, and the voltage regulation is going to end up looking a lot more similar to the uh, classified, but it's still better. So anyway, so that's the V-droop disabled now, um, which you can't tell while the card is at idle. Um, but once we run, um, and the interesting thing about disabling the V-droop is it actually boosts the score. Not by a huge margin, but it does boost the score. Um, so, yeah, and now you can see that, like, peak-to-peak -peak is, like, 200 millivolts. So still significantly better than the classified card. Because um, that was, again, like, 200... Well, that was 240-ish, so we're at, like, 210 now. So, you know, 30 millivolts. But that's that's still quite an improvement. Um, and then, like, max is 286, whereas the max on the classified was, like, over 300. Um, there's also less undershoot. I have, like, better, like, more uh, standard, like, higher sample count tests that we're going to look at later for comparison. Um, but what we should see is, I think, like, a 200 or 300 point increase in the score by just disabling the V-droop, which is just a thing on NVIDIA GPUs. Like, I've seen the same effect with a GTX 970, where you don't touch the clock slider, you don't... You don't touch anything and you just disable V-Droop or you just raise the average voltage and you just end up with more FPS um, because the clock readouts in the software lie constantly. Like I am not certain that you can actually get an accurate clock measurement from NVIDIA GPUs. It's always like some simplified approximation of what is actually happening because yeah, th these cards just, like, you give them more voltage and the performance goes up, even though the clock readouts all stay the same. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we got our we got our extra 200 points. Score's really low, though. <laughs> Man. The capture card eats, like, 500 points. That's That's horrible. Wait, does that mean when I was benching the GTX 960 on LN2 on stream... I actually nerfed myself by running it into the... I... Yeah, I probably did. So apparently the best way to do do uh, GPU benching would be... Um, would be to point a camera at a monitor. That's really annoying. <laughs> Mostly because of, like, the space requirements, right? Because it's like, you need to have enough space to point the camera at the monitor. Which, uh, I'm a bit short on space. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so that's, like, the funny thing with the, the V-Droop on NVIDIA GPUs is, like, if you turn it off, you get more performance. Now, the downside is turning off the V-Droop makes the card run hotter. Um, so it actually gives you, like, it negatively affects core stability, Right? So you end up in this sort of awkward situation where, like, you might want to test, like, max performance with V-Droop turned on, and then max performance with V-Droop turned off, and then maybe even, like, because if we go into the EVC2 software, um, you can see that we actually have an option to, like, scale it. So, like, minus 100% removes all V-Droop, but there is options like, say, uh, minus 55%. Right or minus uh, minus fifteen percent, or you can add more V droop. Um, right, um, so you know you can like basically change the amount of V droop to like a silly degree, and each configuration is going to give you like slightly different performance. Like as you remove V droop, it's going to perform worse and worse, but it might clock higher and higher. Actually, it's not even might clock higher and higher. I can pretty much guarantee that if you take the, 
like the core clock slider in Afterburner, you're going to be able to push that higher and higher the more V-droop you apply to the to the GPU, but the performance for a given clock is going to be lower than if you ran that same clock, but at a higher voltage. But of course, running that same clock at a higher voltage might not be physically possible. Fun. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the the complications with this whole uh, like V droop situation uh, on on like Nvidia GPUs is like v, like not having V droop. So like you can sort of look at the VRM configuration of the classified, the fact that it doesn't have V droop right out of the box, um, as um, as a basically it's like the the default configuration of the VRM is for like max performance instead of like max stability um which is like but at the same time you have to consider like well you could get more performance at lower clocks so it's weird uh i'm yeah not not really like i am i am not a big fan of this this behavior on like nvidia gpu it like it is it's kind of interesting but it's also kind of annoying when you have a a gpu where it's like well the you know it says i'm running some clock speed but am i actually running that clock speed who knows the fps and, and the other issue this creates is like um cards that have better voltage regulation will just inherently have better performance um so that's fun. It's again, it's not a huge margin, right? Like we went up by 200 points, but I will say this 200 points thing is very consistent. Um, Cause yeah, I did a bunch of tests. Like I did some testing on this and uh, let me pull that in. Um, so here you can see some previous test results that I did. So I ran these tests in like, uh, you can see the order that I ran the tests in, right? So this was the first test and we got 23 and this was not into the capture card. This was into the monitor. Um, so that's why the score is higher. That's why I'm like annoyed by the capture card right now. It's just like, oh, it just ate 500 points. At least I think it's the capture card just ate 500 points. I'm not gonna test it right now because you, like, you wouldn't be able to watch the benchmark run, right? I mean, I guess you could watch the scope, but anyway, so 23,520 uh, points on the very first run, then 23,550, 23,550, so very consistent. Um, and then I turn the V-droop off, and we get 23,741, 23,773, 23,662. So at this point, I thought, like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's not, like, because there was, like a, like, a slight upwards trend in these scores, right, where, like, this is slightly higher and higher, and I'm like, oh, so maybe, maybe this is just, like, run-to-run -run variance, um, and so that, that's why the test order is, like, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then test seven, I turn the V-droop back on, and the score immediately drops down below to, like, 23,600 points, right, so we're back down to 23,570, 23,564, I turn the V-droop off again, and it immediately goes back up to like 23,737, 23,754, 23,753. So not having V-droop does improve performance. Not by very much, right? Like this is like at a 23,000 point score, we're getting like 200-ish points. That's like 1%, right? So like from from the like out-of-box configuration, it actually makes perfect sense to ship with V-droop for, Gal uh, for Ga Galax because uh, it, it's, it costs them like 1% performance. It improves like it improves the power efficiency of the card. Uh, it reduces the coil line. Like you probably can't hear it, but when I turn the V-droop off, the amount of coil line that this card makes goes up drastically. Like it coil winds a bit on the 0 0.3 milliohm load line, but with no V-droop whatsoever, it's really loud. <laughs> it's very, very loud. So, um yeah um so that's that's just kind of that so yeah turning off e-droop gives you more performance um kind of like how raising voltage on nvidia gpus can sometimes give you more performance at least up until the point that it destabilizes whatever clocks you're trying to run and then you need to lower the clock speed but um yeah so that's that and now for the comparison against the classified um, cause I did just take like more formal measurements. Um, 
So here is the classified in its default configuration. Right, and you can see like how I like, how I mentioned earlier, like, oh, with no V droop you get a kind of symmetrical waveform, right? Like you get similar amounts of undershoot as you get overshoot. So this looks kind of symmetrical. And then if you see the default configuration of the Hall of Fame, um, you'll see that this is not very symmetrical, right? Like it's sort of bottom heavy. Um, where it's like but yeah. Um like these these gaps in there, right? You don't really see like you don't you, like you still have those same gaps because those are just like the workload cycling. But you'll notice that like that gap is mirrored above and below the waveform instead of just like like there's just a bite taken out of the lower portion of the waveform here. Whereas here you can see that like you get the the same gap on both sides of the waveform instead of just from one side. And that's like very easy way to tell if like, hey, there's V-droop on this. Um, it's just like, yeah, you can, you can see that like here, we're in like, uh, like th this is a low current situation. So there's little V-droop and this is a high current situation. So there's, right, so we get the bite in from the top, but not, not from below. Whereas on this, you actually can't tell how much current the card is pulling because uh, it, is always targeting the same uh, average voltage. But anyway, so this is 700 samples. So this was Firestrike on loop. Um, so I think this is like two loops of Firestrike GT1. Um, and this is just to get like better better statistics um, on the oscilloscope. You can see that the average voltage over the duration of those runs was like 1.05 volts. Uh, with the Hall of Fame, with the V-Droop, lower average voltage, right? Because at high loads, the card is actually just, like the VRM is actually just targeting a lower operating voltage, right? The vid request for both of these scenarios is actually exactly the same, but the target voltage for the voltage regulator when you have V-droop is significantly lower anytime the, the current output current is really high. So the average voltage when running a high current load like Firestrike is lower. Um, so the GPU pulls less power, the GPU runs cooler, and it also produces less, like, less FPS. <laughs> so, yeah, um, not much less FPS, but it does very measurably produce less FPS. And this is, like, again, that balancing act of, like, do I want more clocks or do I want more performance per clock? Because with NVIDIA cards, the, the like, as you raise voltage, your power consumption, like, skyrockets and your stability, like, the thermals make the stability way worse. Um... But anyway, so here we can see that a minimum of 886 millivolts versus 905, right? So funnily enough, we actually kind of have worse worst case scenario undershoot here, um, even though our peak to peak on average looks better because it's 143 with a max of 192 versus like a max of 287 with an average of 250, right? And these are both as five milliseconds uh, per division timescale. That's important for the peak to peak measurement because if your timescale is different, this this gets bigger, right? And at smaller timescales, the peak to peak gets significantly smaller. But the other thing you could look at is just like max overshoot. This maxed out at 1.172 volts. This maxed out at 1.23 volts. So yeah, there's heaps more overshoot over here because like when, when the VRM, uh, basically when the load release occurs, you're already, you're like at the target voltage, right? Like you're sitting at 1.05 volts. And when load release hits, the you're like driving the voltage up from 1.05. Whereas here, because you have V-droop, when you're transitioning from very high load to low load, your voltage is starting at a lower point, right? You're starting at a lower voltage initially. So you don't get like the peak of the overshoot ends up lower because your, your starting point is lower. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so this this looks like it absolutely blows the classified out of the water because the peak to peak is so much lower, but that's just because there's V droop. Um, so it's kind of like, and it's not really comparable. It's it's basically like it's so yeah, this isn't really comparable because we have V droop, and now uh, the no V droop measurements. So here's the no V droop result. The Hall of Fame is still better. Okay, you can very clearly, like, if you just look at the peak to peak, on average, about 220 millivolts versus uh, 250 millivolts on the classified. You know what? At this point, I might just pull in some pictures of the of the classified PCB as well, so we can look at them. And this this is going way past what I originally planned for this video, but like, 
like, too late. Oh, come on, don't... No. I hate tab groups. In Edge. The way it just, like, automatically creates them. So, anyway. So, Hall of Fame. No V-Droop. Um... Average voltage much closer to the classified now, right? 1.046 versus uh, 1. Point, uh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Uh, 1.05. So the like relative numbers are now cl like we can basically just compare minimum versus minimum directly because um, the average voltage is so close together. Um, I mean, this is still like four millivolts lower, but close enough in my opinion. So. Worst case scenario undershoot on the classified was 905 millivolts. Worst case scenario undershoot in the on the Hall of Fame was 921 millivolts. So about 15 millivolts better undershoot performance with no load line. Uh, on average, uh, 951 millivolts undershoot. Uh, this was 943. So the average undershoot like is not as uh, like you don't doesn't see as much of an improvement um, going from the classified as from uh, from the classified to the Hall of Fame. But um, the worst case scenario undershoot does matter because um, if at any mo if for a single frame or like for a single calculation, right, the voltage on the core drops too low, the card will crash. Um, so we want this minimum. So like those 15 millivolts, that probably translates to maybe like five megahertz. Like a single, actually, I'm not even sure if 10 series has five megahertz core clock steps, but like, you know, it's a couple megahertz. Also, the fact that the undershoot is just generally better on average means that we get less clock stretching just across the board. Um, so this will be slightly faster. Like if you had exact same silicon quality, which we obviously, I can't control for that. Um, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I could, but that is just way outside my case. Like, I can't control for the silicon quality. Um, but if you had to, like, basically, if you, the Hall of Fame PCB versus the classified, if we assume that the silicon quality was exactly the same, so the same core um, quality, then the Hall of Fame would have a slight, like, performance per clock edge, and it should even clock slightly higher. Um so it should just generally give, deliver slightly, very slightly better performance because um, of the, the weird quirks of like NVIDIA's clock stretching functionality. And so just having less undershoot just automatically means more FPS. Um, not by a huge margin, right? But it, it does, does boost FPS. So that's kind of fun. Uh, and then overshoot now is at 1.2 on 4. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty similar to the classified. The overshoot, I really don't care about that. Just, that just doesn't really matter in my opinion. Um, and uh, yeah, so the Hall of Fame is uh, better to my complete lack of surprise because if you just look at these two PCBs, uh, it is quite obvious that the Hall of Fame is going to be better, um, right? If you look at the front, um, so this is a 12-phase VRM. This is a 14-phase. They both have doublers. This is on discrete MOSFETs. This is on power stages. I don't really think that plays much of a role here, though technically the power stages could have somewhat, like, faster... Like, the delay between the PWM signal being sent from the controller to the uh, power stages, the power stages might react faster than the d discrete MOSFETs, um, but I don't really think that that's the main source of the difference here. Um, in terms of capacitor configuration, uh, this has a bunch of through-hole polymers, right? Um, then we have a bunch of SP caps, then we have some multi-layer ceramics mixed in. And the Hall of Fame is just like, yeah, we've also got some through-hole polymers. Um, there's less of them dedicated to the V-Core VRM on the Hall of Fame. Like, the total number of them is fewer. But these are 1,200 microfarad, whereas these are 820 microfarad. Um, then we have SP caps. These are 470 microfarad, whereas the classified uses 330s. So that is more capacitance per SP cap. And I think the total number of them probably, it seems, to, it might be about the same because the classified has a lot of them on the front and then not that many on the back, whereas the Hall of Fame has like an even, like same number on the back and front as far as I can tell. It looks like they just mirrored the capacitor bank for both sides of the PCB. Um, and then, of course, we have multi-layer ceramics, but this is, like, well, so this is, like, a slight, not super obvious difference, because at a glance, uh, these just look like 0805s, 
right? Like the package size looks like an 0805 multi-layer ceramic, um, which looks the same as these, which are also 0805s. Um, as like, you also have these like little ones mixed in on the Hall of Fame, but the main big ones, those just look like regular 0805s. Um, actually, wait, that's an 0805. These might be slightly smaller than an 0805. But anyway, the big difference between, um, well, the, the sort of noteworthy thing about the multi-layer ceramics on the classified is these are half height. These are not full height 0805s. So at best, they have like half the maximum capacitance for that footprint. And the reason why EVGA did this is so that they would fit under the back plate on the back of the card. Because um, yeah, this card has a back plate that sits lower than what the Hall of Fame has. They both have back plates, but the Ho Hall of Fame back plate sits higher above the PCB. And so Galax just like, especially like coming up to the core, these are full size 0805s. These are half height. Um, right, so th these are half height, these are full height 0805, so that's just like, that's just more capacitance, right? Like right behind the core in the multi-layer ceramics, these are just bigger multi-layer ceramics. Another difference, um, on the classified, this is a 330 microfarad polymer, two terminals. Um, that's a 330, this is a 330, that's a 330. On the Hall of Fame, these are all 560s. And they're three terminal polymers. Um, and basically the three terminal variant has lower ESL. Um, so they, well, I'm not sure if they necessarily have the same ESR, but they probably do. Um, Cause if you're like, these are high end PCBs, I would assume that EVGA isn't using some, you know, budget SP caps from Panasonic with 15 milliohms of ESR. These are probably gonna have like, actually, I don't think the NVIDIA spec even allows for 15 milliohms of ESR on the bulk capacitors behind the core. So these are going to be like, five, like these should be like 5 milliohm ESR or lower. Um, so these, the ones on the Hall of Fame are going to be very similar in that sense. But the three terminal packaging reduces the, like the series inductance of the capacitor. The goal of doing this um, is to basically make the capacitor even fat, like better at filtering um, like fast switching noise, um, like the very fast transients that you get from a GPU core. So yeah, I, I gotta say, I'm really not surprised that the Hall of Fame has better voltage regulation than the classified card does. Um, cause just looking at this output capacitor bank, like Galax went, like th this is about as good as it gets for SMD aluminum polymers. Like you can't buy better ones. The three terminal, like three terminal variant, 560 microfarads, highest capacitance you can get. I think at the time that this card was made, this would be like the highest capacitance aluminum polymer you could get with the lowest ESL packaging that you could get. Um, so yeah. And then we also have the fact that like these multi-layer ceramics are just bigger than the ones that you get on the classified. So that helped, you know, a bit more capacitance by the core. Then coming off of the VRM, there's just like more ceramic. Just in general, there's just more of them. Um, so in terms of total capacitance, the Hall of Fame is probably like slightly more. And then also in terms of just capacitor con configuration, it's just more. Um, another interesting thing is the inductors all on the Hall of Fame. And I'm not sure how much this probably mainly affects the undershoot. Um, the inductors on the Hall of Fame are probably all 180 nanohenries. I'm not 100% certain because I can't actually see the inductance values on the ones in the vCore VRM, but this one over here is 180 nanohenries, and so I'm assuming that these are all the same inductor and these are all 180 nanohenries, whereas the classified uses 300 nanohenry inductors, which basically means the inductors are a bit slower. Um, so, though I don't think that's that's going to make much of a difference in this scenario. I really think it's mostly down to the capacitor choices. Um, the classified does have the advantage, like it does have this capacitor over here, which we don't have on the Hall of Fame. Because um, it didn't, like, the Hall of Fame has a front plate that, like, sits lower than the... Or actually, it's not even that it sits lower, it just doesn't have the cutouts that the classified has. Does it? No, no, this, this covers. It might, okay, it sits lower. I think it just sits lower. 
Anyway, another difference that I don't think is actually that significant is the input filtering on the Hall of Fame is just kind of ridiculous. That is a lot of ceramic. <laughs> just like, yep. Like, Galax, like, Galax really does just, uh, though, I guess you don't have any, like, you don't really have a lot of ceramic on the front of the board. But if you look at the classified, um, I mean, on the back, you don't really, like, I'm pretty sure this is actually for the driver. I see, like, I think this might be the bootstrap capacity. Okay, no, this is probably the bootstrap. Um, so yeah, but you, you know, like, you have, like, a snubber resistor. Actually, wait, this is going to be the snubber capacitor. Yeah, so this doesn't actually come... So the multi-layer ceramics behind the power stages, th those are there to basically provide a uh, charge when the MOSFETs first, like the high side MOSFET switch is on. Because um, you get like the, the MOSFETs switch on really fast um, and your through hole capacitors aren't really great for dealing with that kind of thing. So it's standard practice for, for power stages and really any... Uh, switching regulator that you put a multi-layer ceramic capacitor like right up against your high side MOSFET so that it can absorb the turn on transient. Um, and you can obviously put more of them because more is better, <laughs> right? Which is basically what Galax did is just like m more ceramic. Um, anyway, uh, and then on the front of the classified, uh, yeah, we just have some little ones right up against the high side MOSFETs. Um, and then in terms of the total bulk capacitance, I mean, we can just, like, this is seven through hole capacitors, whereas, uh, Galax, just one, I think there's, like, one per phase, probably. Okay, maybe not one per phase, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, this is more, I mean, technically the ones for the memory over here, you could count those in, but it's still, like, these are, this is seven plus three, right, whereas this is... Like, this is actually just 12 in total. Um, same capacitance, though. So these are also 270s. But, yeah. So, like, the input filtering, probably not that different between the two. But the output filter on the Hall of Fame is just, like, they just went extra on it. Um, like, you could maybe argue that, oh, they should have used the three terminal polymers in place of the two terminal ones that they used over here. But I think this far away from the GPU core, the three terminal polymers versus the two terminal polymers thing probably doesn't actually matter. Um, it's kind of like putting three terminal SP caps on a on a motherboard. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's great that you got this like super low low ESR ESL capacitor, and then then it has to go through a CPU socket anyway. But this is a GPU, so you don't really have to worry about that. Um, which is also why, like, on GPUs, you get, like, these super tiny multi-layer ceramics directly behind the GPU core, whereas doing something like this on a motherboard would be utterly pointless because the CPU saw... Like, the these capa like the little multi-layer ceramics are used because they have even lower equivalent series inductance. And, yeah, you wouldn't do this on a motherboard because on a motherboard, the, the CPU socket it just makes that irrelevant. Um, but, um, yeah, so... The Hall of Fame, uh, to my, like, first of all, I'm really surprised that it comes with, like, V-Droop out of the box, and, uh, I'm not surprised that it just has better voltage regulation than the classified. Um, the, the waveform difference looks quite dramatic, but you have to consider that the waveforms aren't taken in the exact same part of Firestrike, and, uh, also, like, the overshoot doesn't matter that much. It's mostly the undershoot that's important. But still, like, 15 millivolts is, is a lot. Like, I mean, I'm not surprised to see it, but, like, it it, it is a lot. So, yeah, I guess Galax going just, um, well, extra on, well, everything. <laughs> um, paid off, I guess? Um, uh, Yeah. So anyway, after seeing those measurements, I modified the classified. So we're, we're going to take a look at that in a separate video. Because uh, this video is now 40 minutes, um, which was not my intention. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully you found this interesting. Because I can, I'm pretty certain it isn't useful. And I will be doing a full PCB breakdown of the, of the Hall of Fame. Where we will go into even more excruciating detail on... Uh, well, like the capacitors, but also some other features, like what do these switches do? Um, and also, like, what are these MOSFETs for? Um, 
I mean, those aren't actually that interesting. These are, like, I don't like, these MOSFETs are like, uh, well, we won't get into that. Not the point of this video. So, anyway, uh, yeah. So, the Hall of Fame PCB is, in fact, somewhat better than the classified PCB. Um, and that's it. So, thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. I've also got a Bandcamp. I'm also, like, developing an FPS game that you might want to check out. There's a link to that in the description as well. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts and hoodies and posters and, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And, uh, yeah, that's it for the video. So, thanks for watching and goodbye.